Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this CNBC program from the World Economic Forum in Dalian. Our focus here, how do we lead a human-centered revolution? How can we make technology work in the interests of everybody on the planet, not just the chosen few? We have a terrific panel to get into that conversation. And let me just very quickly do the introductions here. Hao Jingfeng joins us. Thank you very much for being on our panel. Uh, she is an economist, but also a science fiction writer. So hopefully she's going to take us to some very interesting places cool. where we will get some views from the future. Uh, Dan Rusgaard is with us. Dan is a, an engineer, an artist. Uh, he's been taking people out to talk about uh, pollution and carbon mm -hmm. and show people that there actually can be an alternative. I'm very much looking forward to how you express Thank the you. alternative Thank and how that me. might yeah. work. Yeah. Um, Maria Elena Torres Padilla joins us, director of the Institute of Epigenetics and Stem Cells at the Helmholtz uh, Zentrum. Uh, in Munich in Germany. Uh, thank you very much for being for here you. and uh, giving us an insight into how uh, genetic therapies can be managed in an ethical context. Very nice to have you here. And Lauren Woodman is with us, uh, Chief Executive Officer at NetHope USA. Lauren, welcome. Uh, thank you also for being with us. Um, the whole ethos of this World Economic Forum this year has been about the fourth industrial revolution and it's been about how we can make this inclusive growth that takes everybody along with it. What I'd like to do very quickly is just get some ideas from each of you based on where you view the story from as to how that might happen and Lauren I'd like to start with you if I might. Thank you um, and thank you for the opportunity to have what I think is an incredibly important conversation. Um, NetHope works in the humanitarian development and conservation space across a number of nonprofit organizations around the world. And I think one of the things that we worry about with the coming of the fourth industrial revolution is how do we make sure that communities and perspectives that are not always represented um, in conversations are in fact represented and represented authentically. That is difficult to do. I don't know that we've quite figured that out yet. But I think even the process of recognizing that that is a gap and that we have to struggle against that problem means that we are at least beginning to bring those voices in so that the fourth industrial revolutions and its benefits can be inclusive and applicable to everyone. Can private capital be allowed to work uh, in a way that is both ethical and responsible or should that be the responsibility of public bodies and we allow private capital just to do what it does, whether it's ethical or not? No, I think, look, this is a, this is a multicultural, multipolar world in which we all have a stake in seeing it succeed. And, and, and I think that the tension between the, the private sector and the public sector and the civil society and each of us individually is a good tension to have. And that tension needs to be respectfully, but adequately used as an opportunity to make sure that the benefits um, do, in fact, surface to the top. And you know, we, we may have on occasion lost some of that civility, but I think the benefits of what we have coming towards us and, and what we could accomplish demand that we adopt um, a much more civil approach, demand that we adopt a much more inclusive approach so that the outcomes on the, on the other, on the first steps of this process actually do really benefit us all. Let, let's take a, just a very practical example here and I, I'd welcome your opinion on this. Um, Bill Gates and many others have suggested that one way to redress the balance may be to tax the robots. So as an employee is displaced, somehow they are compensated mm -hmm by some kind of living income maybe if they lose them again that that's the right answer do we tax the robots do we add a levy where technology causes displacement i am not an economist um, nor am i a, a labor specialist so i will leave that to my colleagues who have much more insight on on what the appropriate <laughs> taxation policy is what i will say though is that technology has always had an impact technology has always displaced um, you know, a great example is we used to have folks that ran elevators, right? We no longer have the, the folks that, that operate elevators anymore. 
And so I don't know what the right tax policy is, what the right economics policy is, but I think we need to recognize that technology will always have an impact in, in a way that may displace some, and it is our responsibility as a society to make sure that we have opportunities for education and retraining and skilling and growth for those that may have been impacted, whether that's through taxation or, or otherwise, I, I will leave to those that are far smarter on those issues than I. Yeah, but, but my fundamental question is really about whether we take punitive action against yeah. organizations that are innovative, or we so, try... So, so, so everything you wanna, which progresses, you wanna tax it. Maybe we should text the ones which are pulling us down, which are help us polluting, don't you think? We, that we that would even, sort of make more we, sense. We haven't even got to you yet, but already you're adding to the conversation on hey, the sorry, panel. I'm, I'm Dutch, this is my, uh, yeah, you have but, to forgive but, me. But, but <laughs> Lauren, just, just to finish on that, uh, because I think, I think what your project does is, is very much about cooperation Absolutely. and getting NGOs and companies and, and governments to talk to each other. That's a cooperative approach, but capitalism quite often is confrontational. And sometimes you need to make people pay for the changes they bring. Fair enough. Capitalism is confrontational in the sense that there, are, there is competition in a market that gets to a better outcome. But capitalism doesn't exist in a vacuum. I don't get to make a product and have to, I have to have someone to sell it to. Mm. But that, that is, within and of itself, a type of cooperation. It may not be a, a rosy view of, com of cooperation, but it is collaborative. It does require parties on both sides. And there has to be, in that transaction, benefits on both sides. And so I don't think that you can say you know, that, that an entire class of production right, needs to be taxed in order to compensate here. It, at some level, that's a case-by-case -case basis. But I do think we need to look at the, the whole of the outcome. And I think we need to make sure that in weighing those benefits and in shaping the, the pros and the cons and the benefits and the risks, mm. that everyone that is affected is included in that conversation. Because otherwise, it is then a one-sided conversation and there is no cooperation. Thank you. Uh, Maria Elena, um, how do we make growth and innovation inclusive, particularly in the area that you operate in? Yeah, so I could say that globally, really, the, the objective for the scientific research is um, how do we make sure that everyone not only understands but gets a share of the benefits of scientific research, which are actually at, at multiple levels. So coming back to your question of um, how we get it inclusive and human-centered, um, you know, if we think about human center, I would say we have to focus on the well-being of the human being. Uh, we have to be respectful of the nature of the human being and of, by extension, its environment. And I think we also need to be respectful of the diversity and the, and the variety. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's many ways. Uh, one can actually uh, simply talk about uh, healthcare. We all benefit of different levels of healthcare, depending on where we come from, where we mm. live. Uh, healthcare actually results from scientific endeavor uh, from many, many years ago. Uh, I think that um, I, I could agree with what you've just heard that uh, we need to come to a table to see what, well, you know, I have benefited of uh, certain healthcare during my 40 uh, years of life. How do I make sure that my colleague on the other side of the planet can share at least the same benefits that I have? So I, I do agree that the main key is to bring people to the table to discuss this. Let, let, me, let me sharpen the question. Um, is CRISPR gene editing technology ethically and morally right? So I think your uh, question has been debated over the last two or three years by many, many, many different councils. So I am not going to give you a yes and no answer, I'm afraid. Um, I can tell you that you can uh, at least split your question in two. Uh, the genetic engineering can be seen in the germline, and I think this is what for many people poses an ethical problem, right? Do we uh, make a genetic modification of our children, our kids? Um, genetic modification in the somatic cells, in a, in a, in a, in a liver, or uh, this is a different issue. And in that, I can probably say, no, it is not. I think the germline considerations are to be taken into an ethical discussion that should involve multiple stakeholders stakeholders and, and people from different backgrounds. Is it ethical to grow organs in animals? <laughs> Again, a very complex uh, question. Um, <laughs> that, that's why he's asking. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, so, so the, um, you know, if, if, if I come back to my roots where I started about it has to be human centered, it has to respect the well-being mm. of the human yeah. being and of its yeah. nature and its environment. Mm. So the people are currently um, using animals to grow organs. Because if you want to replace an organ after an injury or an accident or a disease, the organ actually 
researchers have found that we need also the 3D architecture of the, of the body so that the organ can actually fulfill its, its, its function. Um, so because you cannot do this test in human for ethical considerations, people have turned to animals. I would say that it, as long as, and, and, and this is very it's clear, right? You can graft a gut cell in, in, in the pig and then you have a little gut that potentially can be then put back to, uh, to the human being. It's not yet quite ready, but this is, this is, this is the purpose. And I think that, as, as for me, that doesn't pose an ethical consideration because it's respectful of the human nature and it's respectful of the animal as, as long as uh, there's some regulation on, on, on the ethics behind uh, handling the animal. So you're really, you're really upgrading humans, humanity. In, in, in a way, Can I you, say that, you, well, you're serving the purpose of in, in improving health after an accident or a regeneration problem or disease. Uh, but I mean, this is really in its infancy. The, the things are just really at the basic research mm. level. And, 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 and just a, a, a wrap-up question, and I, I'm aware that I am I'm being very tough on you here, but it, it's a question about sharing the benefits yeah. of this research universally. In some countries, there is approval to do stem cell research on fetuses and um, at a very early stage, um, and quite a late stage sometimes, but not in others. Does that ultimately mean that there isn't a level playing field in terms of mm -hmm. sharing the benefits of progress? So let, let me, I like toughness actually, so this is very good. But let me just again try to split conceptually your question. So stem cell research and fetuses research are very different things. You can do stem cell research without perturbing fetuses. And I think that has created a lot of confusion in the public that thinks stem cell research is very bad because it has to do with fetuses. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually not true. Um, so coming back to the question of whether it's, is it legal or is it ethical correct, to do stem cell research. Um, so the, the, the legislation across different countries is very different um, because of um, cultural differences, because of historical differences. Um, and again, you know, one will have to see what, what part is ethical and what part is unethical. Is that the derivation of the cells? Is that the use of the cells for therapy? And there again, you know, the discussion is actually multiple. Again, I think, and I would agree, uh, we need to bring, um, even if there's maybe not a, a universal solution that will tell you yes, or no, we need to bring the debate um, to the table. We need to make sure that the public understands what we are talking about, what are the potential benefits. Um, I think that's just the start uh, to making the benefits to be shared, because in the end, the ultimate goal is to uh, maybe bring better healthcare, right? And, and we, we need to tackle uh, this um, uh, inclusive uh, business from, from the very beginning, not only when we actually got to the position where we can actually do the thing. Yeah. Dan, let's, um, let's bring you in. I don't think I can stop you, but um, let's bring you in. Uh, I'm as humble as you are. Share, share, with us, um, share with us then your thoughts on this. How do, we, how do we make this growth inclusive? Well, no, and I can really appreciate the comments uh, because when we talk about fourth industrial revolution, it means we had a first, a, first, a second and a third. Mm. And that, that gave us a lot of benefits and, and we made cities and we can communicate and travel and have a lifestyle and at the same time, I live in cities sometimes which are, are, are machines that are damaging us, which make sure that children have lung cancer when they're eight years old, which makes sure that, that we live five to six years shorter. So I think we're in a very weird but beautiful momentum that technology on one hand en enhances us, yeah, like what you're saying, but the other hand is sort of demolishing us. Um, I am fascinated by that. How can we balance that? So right now I am inspired by Beijing smog which is a, a beautiful experience, I can tell you. Um, uh, the dream of clean air. Mm. I think lifestyle is not so much more about a, a Louis Vuitton bag or a Rolodex or a Ferrari, but about clean air, mm. uh, clean energy, um, uh, clean water. These are the values that China and also India, these developing countries, are really embracing, my generation, eh, 30, 35. Mm. Um, and that's what I want to be a part of. So, so what is fascinating for me for industrial revolution is the notion of nature in a way, or human nature, or, or nature as in animals. Mm. We had a panel discussion uh, this week, which was great, with a biological person, uh, National Geographic, where we looked at the world of ants. So an anthill below the ground. Eh? And they are incredibly smart. An anthill doesn't have a traffic jam. Mm. Fascinating. <laughs> and they have tubes. Some have polluted air, some have clean air. They have air conditioning without electricity. Mm. So, so for me, the, the next evolution, eh, or revolution, is to understand the principles from nature, copy morph or copy mutate it to our world, and use design and science to improve life. And, and that will create a collective. 
are we there yet? Are we there yet? No. Uh, but it's really a question of, of, of not thinking in opinions, but thinking in proposals. And mm. I'm not a politician. I cannot write a law. I can make stuff. That, mm. that is what I do. So that's what I try to do. Mm. Um, yeah. The, one of the dilemmas, it seems, is uh, how do you balance uh, emerging economies' desires to have what they see in the West with the need to create growth in yeah. a sustainable way? It, it feels like, well, clearly we're not quite there with the technology or the cost side of that equation, otherwise the air would be clean in Beijing. True. But I think the beauty is because I think China did in 50 years what Europe took 500 years. So it's, it's, it's not better or worse, it's different. And that also creates a new playground, a new field of experiment, of knowledge, of science, of evolution. So for example, this morning we worked together, we, we announced that with OFO, the, the big bike sharing company, uh, which became very, very popular in China eh, since three years, shareable bikes, that would have been unimaginable. Eh? Five years ago, when my prime minister from the Netherlands, Mark Rutte, he cycles to the House of Parliament eh, in, in, in The Hague, in the Netherlands. When my Chinese friends saw that, they are like, is he poor? Can he not own a car? And I'm like, well, he's prime minister. I'm, I'm sure he's fine. Uh, 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 but he likes it. It's good for health, good for body. And that completely changed. Uh, and I think you agree, in three to four years. So we are working now together with OVO to make clean air bicycles smog-free bicycles, which suck up polluted air, clean it on the nano level, and then release the clean air so you can cycle and not be polluted and give clean air to the city. And if you do that one million, two million, three million bicycles, you will get an, in, an, an impact on the index of the air quality. You go 10, 20, 30 percent less. Mm. So what I'm trying to say is it creates a new play field which allows for new innovations. It should always be connected to government, eh? clean uh, energy, electrical cars, etc., etc. But I like this sort of top-down, bottom-up movement. Mm. And that's why it's so important to be here at World Economic Forum, where young makers, young global leaders, and the ministers and the mayors of this world work mm. together to say, how, how, how can we create impact? You know? yeah. that, that's, for me, the new ecosystem. How, how then yeah. do we solve the problem of uh, duplication in competition, because you mentioned one bike producer. There's another one called Mobike, Mobike who yeah, was on one of, my, one of my earlier panels. But if we imagine the, um, the, the, the noxious fumes produced from creating a second set of bicycles which are competing, Fair enough. isn't that a problem? Yeah. How is that inclusive? I understand your comment. Uh, uh, um, first Should we of all, not ban that? Sorry? Only have one bicycle manufacturer controlled by the well, state. Well, there, there's enough pollution for everyone, uh, uh, which we have to <laughs> tackle. So that's already inclusive enough. No, um, I, yeah, yeah. no, I think the more the better. You need diversity. You need variety. You need right. sort of competitive element. And, and I think, yes, maybe some will live and some will die. This is, this is normal. Um, what I want, I, I, don't, I don't believe so much in China copying things. I think they're copy morphing things. So when you look at personal, eh, at WeChat, it's not a copy of Twitter or Facebook, it's, it's something the same but different. Mm. So actually I, I, I don't agree, I think that every company, either bike sharing programs or new material or food or, or fashion, they are mutating, they are learning, uh, because the pressure is so immense to, to change and to adapt. It creates new variants, mm. and that is, for me as a designer, as, a, as an inventor, incredibly fascinating to look at that, yeah. mm. Mm. copy morph. Uh, okay, let's In a way, it's, it's more to, aiming towards the, ge the genetic, biological growth of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's move the conversation on. Hao Jingfang, we, we've talked a lot about your country, uh, <laughs> but you're actually Chinese. Yeah, so Maybe it's fair that she says the it, real uh, thing. Uh, yeah, it, it absolutely right. is. Um, so can I ask you, um, what values do you think the fourth industrial revolution should carry forward? Ah, this is a good question. Actually, I thought you were ask about the Chinese policy on pollution first. But yeah, well, I, I we like can come to that in just a moment. But, okay, uh... <laughs> okay I, I really like this question. I, I think the human-centered is really the um, right keywords in this. We, we, we will have to think about what is a human, what is like to be human and uh, uh, to think about ourselves uh, uh, deeper and deeper in this era of artificial intelligence. Uh, so with the, in the era of artificial intelligence, perhaps um, how human can develop uh, 
our own characteristics and what is our own advantages and uh, what are the differences between human and AI perhaps will become the key question of the uh, all over the world and um, in this era we I, I think that we have to uh, think um, really really hard about uh, how to get everybody into this process so we mm -hmm. have to make sure that all the steps of uh, technological development is about human mm -hmm. is for human and uh, we we do have those everything uh, around the uh, out the people, yeah. then then the technological development is is accepted by everybody of the world. Should those values be universal in emerging economies and Western economies, in Chinese communities and Anglo-Saxon communities, or, or should we have different values that somehow tap into the culture that grew us? Actually, and uh, up to this point, when we compare the human with the artificial intelligence, we found that we are facing a lot of uh, deep values that are shared by all humans because actually we are all the uh, our all ancestors from one small village in in Africa, and uh, all of us uh, has that uh, same uh, ancestors. So. Actually, we do have a lot of things in common, our emotions, our uh, values of the family, our mm -hmm. behaviors, and our um, some, some inner thinking styles, and mm -hmm. all these things are really, really similar for all human beings, whatever your country is. So I, I don't think there are a lot of differences on this aspect. Mm. And you write about displacement. You write about inequality. Your uh, fictional work deals with dystopia. Is that a reflection of the way people feel in China? What does that tell us, if anything, about the Chinese attitude to technological innovation? Uh, yes, there are always uh, uh, different folds in the question of inequality. Some are caused by the policies, by some are caused by the market e uh, economy, and some are caused by the uh, globalization, and some are caused by the technology. So uh, all the different sources uh, cause this different phenomena. And for the uh, problem of uh, technological development, I don't think it's, it's country-based. Uh, I don't think it's a... a a Chinese specific question. Mm. It is a problem faced by every country. Uh, how can we let everybody in to this process? Because there are a lot of people that can hardly understand what is AI, what is the stem cells, mm. what is uh, virtual reality. They, mm. they are just completely excluded to this uh, process. So how can we just uh, let them in? How can we uh, let the benefit to be shared by all these people. That's a problem by every country. I, I do agree that uh, there are the many problems uh, very unique to China uh, because we do have a lot of special policies, uh, uh, a lot of aspects. But uh, on this, uh, when we face the fourth uh, industrial revolution, I think all the countries are on the same place. We have to deal with these questions together. Mm. And you did uh, raise the issue of uh, uh, Beijing's attitude to air pollution. C could you take a stab at the question? Yes, that's a very complicated question. And uh, uh, first of all, I'm against pollution. I hope that the air is clean in Beijing. And that is one of my biggest hope. But uh, uh, re in reality, uh, the problem is that uh, a large proportion of the air pollution in, in China, uh, especially the places around Beijing, mm -hmm. uh, come from the heavy industries mm -hmm. uh, around Beijing and from the steel industry, the cement and other heavy industries, as well as uh, a lot of construction. Uh, constructional works. Mm -hmm. All these factories are, are quite polluted. And actually, uh, half of the world's steel is uh, mm -hmm. produced in, mm -hmm. in Hebei province yeah. in China. Mm -hmm. So uh, how can we uh, just uh, 
gradually close down this heavy uh, industry, this high polluted industry, is a big question. It's not only a technological problem, not only an economic problem, it's also a problem about employment, about uh, the sta stability of the local life in these uh, provinces. Mm -hmm. Some of those uh, factories are even in the rural areas. So if we just uh, um, uh, close down all these factories, then the government uh, should have uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the mechanisms to just uh, um, help the people there to, mm -hmm. to move forward to, uh, for transition to other industries to make a living. So I, I think that uh, the, uh, the government is, uh, has a headache over this question. Yes. Uh, I, I hope that it can be solved in a few in, in the coming years. Uh, perhaps we can help really help with new technological screen technologies that can can create uh, uh, clean energy or just uh, replace all the uh, production lines in these factories, but I'm not sure if, uh, it's, if, if it's a big project. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One of the challenges, it seems to me, is that actually we're not all on the same page. And it's be become abundantly clear of late that even as China continues to remain committed to a climate change agenda, uh, we've seen Donald Trump step away from this. Mm -hmm. There is suspicion between nations. There is uh, suspicion even within the scientific community itself. Lauren, how do, we, how do we try and bridge the gap here? How do we create trust where trust seems to be very much missing? You know, I think it's, a, it's an excellent question and it's a very difficult question. Um, it, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know that, that, there, there's a, that there is a simple one, two, three path. Right? If we do this thing and we do this thing, then we'll get to trust. Um, yes, we have seen the United States um, pull out of the Paris Accord. You've also seen a number of cities in the United States commit to living up to yes. the Paris Accord. And yes. so that discord is not just at the nation state level, but it's happening at all levels of society. Even within, I'm in, I live in one of those cities that has committed to the Paris Accord. There are some folks in town that think that was a silly thing for us to do. So mm. it, you know, it, those, those differences only get bridged when we have a constructive conversation. Mm. At the end of the day, I, I remain hopeful and, and, I, and I believe that all of us ultimately want the same thing. We want to live in a safe place. We want to have the opportunity um, to, to take care of our families. We want to be able to access health care when we, when we want to. We want to be able to, to, to breathe clean air. The fact that achieving those things is hard mm. And the fact that we have different approaches to how we might solve those problems doesn't make us enemies. It, it, it makes for good yeah. conversation. Yeah. Mm. And, and our ability to sit down and say, OK, what are the things that we can accomplish? And some of those may be small, and they may be short term. But they help us build a relationship and a dialogue that allow us to build on top of one another so that ultimately we can get back to a situation of trust mm -hmm. where we can solve solve some of these tougher problems. I don't believe that our ultimate objectives and our aspirations at, as countries, as humans, as individuals are so different that we cannot begin to, to rebuild that trust, mm. even, if the, even if those first steps are small. Mm. Mm. Dan, you're, you're, you're nodding yeah. away there. Yeah, no, I think because this whole West, Western China, I don't believe in that anymore. You know, there's this famous quote of Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian author, and he once very famously said, on spacecraft Earth, there are no passengers. We are all crew. Mm. And I think that's the mentality that we need to have. Yes, we're makers, not just consumers. And so I completely agree with you. Um, we're in a shifting point. So if you look at the, maybe you can, you can validate that. So the, the cost pollution have in Beijing region only, mm. uh, World Health uh, Institute organization, 321, 324 million US dollar per year, more or less. On, on, on damaging the body, schools being shut down. And again, eh, Delhi, London, Paris, same problem. Different, but same. So I'm sort of like, okay, let's sort of take the budget which, which, <laughs> which we're spending in, in damage and actually invest it in new ideas. We're sort of break even and at least we evolve. Mm. So I completely agree with you. We should, we should create a challenge. Create the place where you have the most clean air, the most clean water, the most clean energy, and realize that, that, that it seems like we're polluting cheaply, but we're going to get the price sooner or later. Again, it's spacecraft Earth. And we should be curious, invest in new ideas, new technology, and improve. 
And, and sometimes there's a tendency to do less. Mm. Eh? Less cars, less this, less that. I think we should do more. So we are forced again mm. together today at World Economic Forum to be creative. Mm. And this is the beautiful human skill that I think that connects us all, this desire to make things, to, to build stuff, to make a mistake, to learn, to evolve. But we need to start doing that. And, and that goes step by step. And, and uh, yeah, that's, that's the biggest challenge, I think, for us all today. But there's no way back. Very simple. Um, I was asking, Do you agree or not? Can well, I ask you a question? Or, yeah? No, you can't. Um, I'm the moderator. Um, I was asking, I was, I was pressing Lauren earlier on this issue of how you get the appropriate behavior that you want to achieve the goals that you set out. Yeah. Do you believe that we use the carrot or the stick when it comes to those who would take advantage of the short-term profit opportunity, even though it may be mm. not so good for the rest of the community, yeah. but they will do that because they don't see any punishment from doing it. I mean, how do we amend behavior to make sure everybody's on the same page? Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I don't know. I think, you know, you have to have a vision a dream, a purpose, and maybe this is government, maybe this is companies. I've seen companies change from polluting oil, disgusting technology to completely energy neutral, biodegradable. And they did it not just because of I'm a hippie and I want to feel happy, mm -hmm. maybe also a bit, but also because they realize it's the way to go future proof. Mm -hmm. It's the only way to have a good business. So you mm -hmm. have to be this sort of, yeah, I call that a hippie with a business plan. Mm -hmm. eh? On one, on one hand, curious and have a desire, but on the other hand, it just makes sense to do it. There's no way back. And again, going back to the nature, eh, like the, the anthill, they somehow found a way to create harmony. Eh? What is also interesting when you talk about the collective, an anthill, it doesn't have a king or a CEO or a boss or a moderator. Um, they, they, <laughs> they, they communicate with themselves. They have a queen, but mm. she's just diva and being fed by, by yeah. fellow colleagues. So somehow they have found a way to communicate with each other in a beautiful way. And I'm not saying we are ants, but I'm just saying, look at that. What can we learn from that? Uh, to make a city, to make a smart city, a smart land. Are you insulted? No, no, no. A smart city and a smart landscape. No. That is a challenge. And I think WEF is one of the places where, where this challenge is being accepted. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we I all... Think, yeah, that's why, I'm, that's why I'm here. It, yeah. it, if we can find sustainable models, I think uh, we will all embrace them. Um, the problem is your version sounds a bit like the Matrix, if you, if you don't mind me saying, where we're all just worker ants working yeah, for somebody yeah. else whether it's the queen or... No, I mean, no because, if because, if, because if we zoom, I think the aliens who look at us from planet Earth, they also think we're ants. So it, it's just a question of scale. We don't know, and we don't know how an ant feels. Eh? Maybe an ant is a very liberal. We no. don't know. So I, no. I don't agree with that. Well, Sorry. Actually, yeah. this, is, this is fodder for your science fiction books, I think, at some point. I, I'd like to no, it's come on. Alina Marie. Ant, Please, uh, yeah, let's get some sense into I, it. I, yeah. I, I really like that. Um, because you. I think... Uh, uh, you may not like the reasons why I like oh, it. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> Are you modifying? Them? No. no, no, because I, so, so you're absolutely right. There's this diva, right? That uh, has the queen. Exactly. And you would say, well, the diva is completely useless, right? It doesn't do anything. But I actually think that if you, if you think about the social organization of the ants, there's a key point of this diva that I think brings the value issue of oh, the yeah. humanity. Yeah. The diva is there because it's the only one that can reproduce the species. True. And, and the yeah. common value of, of the ant colony is that everybody knows what to do because they work towards the same objective. And the objective is the value itself of preserving the species. So and I, I actually could, could share um, yeah, the, the, the discussion. Yeah. There is common values in humanity. Um, trust, I could say, is one of them. And we can learn from nature. So, so the diva is there. It, it actually, it does quite an important thing. And uh, probably the ants work because that's the purpose of yeah. life. Right, we've gone off in some very interesting directions here, but I, I, I do want to I do want to like bring it. it back because yeah. um, one thing that uh, innovation in social media has done mm -hmm. is it's actually brought people closer together, and and the reaction is immediate to things that happen that things approve of or disapprove of. So in a in a way, we are all very reactive and responsive to shifts in mm -hmm. our environment at the moment. And yet, when I look at the messaging yeah. that we see as it relates to innovation and technology, quite often it's negative. 
I don't know how many people in the room can think of a film that they've seen recently that is positive about technology, but I think about The Hunger Games. I think about The Matrix. I think about Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. I think about iRobot. In many ways, these are all mm -hmm. predictors of a much worse society in the future than we have currently. How do we, how do we change mm -hmm. that narrative mm -hmm. into a positive? Because that's what affects popular culture, and that's what shapes people's attitudes to technology. Lauren, is, do we have a problem here? Well, I think we... I think we have a problem if the only way that we see something that is inherently neutral is in a negative way. I mean, look, technology is ones and zeros in silicon, right? I mean, it's not, it, this is not something that has an inherent moral value one way or the other. The, the application of those tools, whether it's scientific research or technological innovations or, or some combination thereof, the, the application of those tools are the things that we are seeing in popular culture that are negative, right? You, you can just as easily imagine a movie um, that you know that, that paints a very rosy picture, right? Where we have solved disease, where we have access to clean water. You know, un unfortunately, and I don't know what this says about us collectively as a species. We we don't but we don't go see those movies, right? None of us ever call um, a company and say, "By the way, I really loved your product. It was fantastic." We call when we have a problem, right? We we that's that's where we articulate um, we articulate our viewpoints. But I think we feel that in, our, in, our, in the way that we use technology, right? in the way that we interact with technology. Technology allows me to do things. Certainly in, in my line of work and, and working with the organizations I work with, I see how technology improves the, yeah. the lives of people who desperately need assistance every day. Yeah. You know, to, to, to watch a refugee be able to talk to a child that, they, that they've been disconnected from for two years because of a conflict that they didn't start and aren't a part of yeah. is, that is a positive application of technology. Mm. I choose to look at it that way. Mm. And I choose to think that that's, we need to do more of that and we need to celebrate that. Because when we look at those popular representations of the way that technology gets played out, mm. it's, it's the same companies that, and types of companies or caricatures of companies that are being blamed for this dystopian future that we see on the big screen that are in fact enabling that kind of positivity and that kind of, of opportunity and that kind of benefit yeah. in the real world. Yeah. How Jing Feng? Yes, uh, I'd really like to make some comment on this question because there, there are two um, aspects of this question. On the uh, aspect of uh, storytelling, actually uh, it is more interesting to make an, a pessimistic future than an optimistic one in the story. So that's uh, perhaps the uh, obvious reason why these uh, uh, films are so uh, horrible. Uh, but actually, the, the main reason is that we have those suspicions in our heart. Uh, so we have those fear uh, of all these things. That's perhaps the deeper reason for this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the reason why we have that kind of suspicion and fear, it's also a human nature. It's, we, we, we always have the fear or suspicion for something we uh, unknown. If it's a box, we, we do not know what's inside. We, we, it's naturally we are feared, oh, wow, what, what is going to do to me? And for the other people, if we just don't know him, we, we just uh, don't know uh, what he's uh, like. And we, we always have this kind of suspicion, oh, what's what is he going to do to me? And we think mm -hmm. bad of him, and that makes the uh, vicious circle. And I will just protect myself. I will t attack yeah. first. I'm aggressive. And he will get my attitude. And he may do bad things to me yeah. uh, on the, as, uh, as a consequence. So these kind of things always happen that uh, we don't know what it is. And uh, we got fear. We have a suspicion. Uh, into it, and we don't know these people, we cannot uh, cooperate with each other. So I think the key element here is for those uh, uh, developers of these technological uh, technologies, 
um, has the responsibility to let everybody mm -hmm. to understand it. What's the principles for it? Uh, how is the mechanism? And let everybody know, okay, it's safe, it's good, and it's uh, very convenient, it's helpful. It's not like a, a monster or a killing machine. And also for, for people, it's their responsibility to communicate, to let one be known by the others and to help each other to communicate with each other. Only when we got of the full knowledge of uh, the things and other people, and then we can trust them, we can uh, make friends with them, we can go together and cooperate mm. with each other. So I think mm, even in the uh, nowadays, it's uh, an era of uh, the um, global media. We still lack of this kind of channel that can let people get real understandings of uh, what's going on uh, in, in, in the other part of the world. I, I think you make a fantastic point, um, and I welcome yeah, I agree. the panelists' other views on this, because the, the robot manufacturer would probably turn around and say, you know what, my job is to innovate robots. It's not to run a PR campaign to persuade the community that robots are a good thing. And you know what? Given that most people are distrustful of what companies do, they won't believe me anyway. In fact, they might be more suspicious of me if they think that I'm overselling the product. Mm -hmm. So how do we address that? So there should be a bridge a channel for the, uh, all the science and technology to bring it to, to the audience. To, so that's the, uh, that's the responsibility for new uh, educational programs, training programs, mm -hmm. and uh, media to, to help to, to, to build this channel for the technology to the yeah. broad audience. But, but I, and I completely agree with you. I think, I think right now we live in a, uh, live, live in a situation of uh, schizophrenia. Because I think it's absurd that on one hand we are feeding our dreams, our hopes, our desires, our fears with the cloud, eh? Weibo, WeChat, Facebook, Twitter. And on the other hand, our, our physical world is more or less either crashing, polluting, becoming more and more generic. When I look at my life, eh? so there's a sort of distinction between the virtual and the physical world. I'm incredibly fascinated about the next steps, what happens when technology jumps out of the computer screen and becomes a part of the things that are wear, the roads that we drive on, the, the, the cities we inhabit. And how can we, like what you say, use that, not just, just to score Facebook likes. Mm. It's like a cave in a, like a monkey in a cave. It's really, it's really like very, we will laugh at it in 15 years, for sure. Uh, but, but to give things which are good for people. And your point is as well, it's about control. So who controls? And I think you addressed it as well. Is that the citizen? Is that the manufacturer? Is that the government? Is that collectively? But your point, and your point is saying, are we having George Orwell? Mm. Or have, are have we, we having Leonardo da Vinci? Is technology using us to dominate, to reduce? Mm. Or to liberate, to enhance, to learn how to fly, to cure ourselves? And I'm not saying I have the answers. All I can do, and I mm. think we all can do, is, is, is put our money on one of them, I, I hope the Da Vinci one, but okay, uh, uh, and make proposals how we want to look, mm. how, how we want that to look like. And that is the crash we are in right now, that's digital, uh, physical, and um, um, uh, this world versus that world. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think you raise That's a, how I feel it. Yeah. No, I think you raise a very good point about the zeitgeist of the moment. Mm. And when we look at politics around the world, it seems increasingly that the politics is about a rejection of globalization yeah. and the innovation that has made globalization a reality. Lauren, how do, how, do we, how do we address that? Do you even agree with the premise to start off with? I mean, when I look at what's going on in the UK, in Europe, the far-right parties, Donald Trump, and so on and so forth, I get the sense that people are actually rejecting what they see as a winner-takes-all type evolution of the global economy, and they're not the winner. They're the ones being left behind. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's a rejection of globalization as a whole. Um, I, 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 at some level, I say, yes, of course it is, because it seems so obvious. Hmm. Um, but on the other hand, I, I think it's more of the latter point that you make, that it is a rejection of a world in which the winner takes all. And it's a rejection of the world in which the winner takes all, and then we don't even bother to acknowledge that we have it all. And we, we, we don't even have a conversation about the people that weren't included in the winner-take-all process. And so I, I actually think that it's, it's much more of a question of feeling not included in a conversation that is very important, that we all recognize is going to be 
you, you know, is the transition to the future, right? We, we know that if we are not in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, we sure as heck are right on the precipice of it. And, and if there is that conversation to take place, and we have gotten to a point where I'm, I, as, as someone who's been displaced, who, who isn't part of this conversation, isn't even being given the opportunity not only to engage, but recognize that I'm worthy of being engaged, then, then that I'm going to reject. Yeah. Now, if that takes, you know, maybe it's, it's taken, it's, 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 it's culminated in a rejection of globalization, but I don't know that it's a question of globalization as a whole. I think within the, especially within, a, within the youth population, there is a broad recognition that we live in a multipolar world. We are not in an east, west, north, south dynamic anymore. This is a world that is truly global. We all have friends from all over the world. But, but when was the last moment you really felt connected? with yourself or the people around. No, sure. I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a question. When, when was the last moment you really felt connected? Because I have the same global village, et cetera. But sure. No, no, but I, I mean, I think people have different levels and concentric circles of relationships. And you know, I feel connected to different yeah. people at different point in time. But I think if I'm a displaced coal worker or, um, or, or I'm living in a rural village in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, I'm not even part of a conversation. There's not a path mm -hmm. for me to be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And the people that are having the conversation don't even recognize that, that I even exist. And so I think, that, I, think that, I think what we have seen is a rejection of that dynamic. And so how do we be more inclusive and say, gosh, maybe we did miss that opportunity. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe we have missed the opportunity to bring those people into this conversation. So let's do that. I, I, and that, I think, starts to bridge that gap mm -hmm. that, has, that has, yeah. has resulted in what we've seen in the, 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 the turnover in politics over the last 18 months. Wh whose responsibility is it to make that happen? I think everyone sitting in this room, I think everyone listening, I, no, I'm That's not good. kidding. I mean, you know, who am I going to point the finger at that says, you are responsible for including me? I am responsible for ensuring that my voice gets heard. Exactly. I am also responsible for making sure that other voices get heard. Mm. I, I don't live on this planet alone. It turns out I'm never going to live on this planet alone. I really hope that something has gone terribly, <laughs> terribly wrong if that scenario shows up. Um, but you know, like it's, and, and, and I require others in order for me to be successful at any level. Mm. Mm. And, and I think that it is incumbent upon all of us to recognize that you know, in a world where winner takes all, that's great for the first couple of days. But it turns out that in a world where winner takes all, there's a small number of winners and a much bigger number of losers. Mm -hmm. And losers don't stay quiet for a long time. No, losers become spoilers. Eh? That's right. That's, and uh, so, you know, like the, this conversation of that, that, you know, a world that benefits only a few is not the world yeah that really anyone wants to live in. And, and therefore, it is incumbent upon all of us to not only make our voices heard, but to make sure that voices are heard. Technology is supposed to help with this. It does. And yet, somehow, we found ourselves in a situation where individually, we love technology. We're recording this as we mark the 10-year anniversary of the iPhone. And I don't see anybody in the room wanting to give theirs up anytime soon, nope. or whatever the rival equivalent is at this point. So at an individual level, people love technology. But somehow, at a group level, we all become terribly suspicious. <laughs> and governments, governments aren't helping us, are they? Yeah. When you look at how people feel about governments, people's trust in governments is incredibly low at the moment. But, do you, but I, I would challenge the premise that, that we believe that technology is the, the, the reason for that. Is it that people don't, te don't trust governments and technology amplifies that distrust? Or is it a question that somehow or another the technology has made governments bad? Right? Or, or worthy of distrust. I am not saying yeah. governments are bad. I mean, yeah. but, you know, or, or worthy of distrust. And, and I think that that's actually the question. It is not the tools that are the problem. It, it is the actions that we take with the tools that we have. Maria, Maria Elena, you were nodding, it looked like you wanted to yeah, come in. Yeah, I actually agree very much on what you're here. I think, you know, we cannot prevent technology. I think it's anti-human to prevent us being creative. So in a way, I very much agree, you know, how we um, apply the tools is, is what we need to uh, focus on. And when mm. you ask about who is responsible, everybody is responsible. Mm. And I think, I mean, in, in the end, we are at the World Economic Forum that promotes public and private um, 
um, collaboration, and I think actually this is one of the solutions, right? I cannot think about the government acting on one side, even from my own perspective as a scientist, and, and, and the private sector on the other side. It's not going to work. If we want to be global about the issue, we, need, we really need to yeah. get together and say, you know, that's the technology, how do we use it best, and how we can reach everyone in the best case scenario. Obviously, I mean, that sounds like a dream, right? But I think this is where we should think how uh, to get there. How did we get to a place, though, where uh, we now think about the world as a beggar thy neighbor situation? That, uh, just for example, you know, we're trying to get a UN charter on the use of robot, robots uh, as, uh, as weapons. And yet, some countries are not prepared to be signatories. So you, ground, you grind to a halt with the mm -hmm. whole negotiation. And then when you look at the, the way that the world seems to be breaking down from a sense of being multipolar to bipolar once again, with countries competing on many fronts. All of this ties back into this issue of how we get people on the same page yeah. Yeah. and appreciating that technology can be inclusive. Well, there, so, there, there's, this, there's this fascinating research done by World Economic Forum, and they did an interview with a lot of smart people all around the world asking what are the top 10 skills you and I need to become successful. Right. And it's really fascinating because when you look at the top three, it's not about money or being really good in C++. It's not about technology. Number three is creativity. Uh, number two is, I think, associated thinking. And number one is problem solving, complex problem solving. So all the things a robot or a machine right now is not so good at. Huh? Mm. And I think that gives me a lot of hope that creativity is our true capital, that our desire for beauty, our desire for collectivity, our desire for change, our human desires will be even more appreciated as our world becomes more technological, technological. Um, so I think our desire for creativity, our desire for curiosity will uh, uh, fight and win against all the things that you very correctly mentioned. Mm. And, and so I will see, I, I, I'm expecting a renaissance of the arts, of the science, of the technology, uh, 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 creative culture, the makers community, mm. because there's time and there's space and there's urgency. I'd, yeah? I'd, I'd yeah. actually like to add something to, to, to the discussion, which I'm very much um, agreeing on. But I think, so when you ask, how do we make sure everyone is on the same web page? Um, I, I, or, or wavelength, you know, depending on the generation that you talk to. Um, I think education is a very important means to get there. We were discussing that earlier, right? How we actually educate our current future generations mm -hmm. to be prepared for all that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it sounds very basic and, you know, very naive to talk, to talk about education, but, but I think education is a key to many of this, bringing everyone to the knowledgeable decision and then being skilled to do the creativity or the solving or the critical thinking. And, and so on. Yeah, I do agree with that. I think education is quite uh, critical at this moment, not only education for kids, but also the uh, lifelong education for everybody to be to, to prepare for the new era. And uh, uh, actually, we are now doing some programs for creative thinking for, mm -hmm. for the kids to, to let them to, to, to foster the creativity for, for the kids. We, we think that uh, to prepare for the future that we really have to focus to those human natures, the great human ca talents like creativity, problem solving, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, empathy, and communication, and the true understandings of each other, and the, the, the way you give meanings to everything. And I think that uh, to, to face the future, it really makes us to make this kind of reflection to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do think that criti uh, creative thinking now is perhaps like a luxury thing for only a small bunch of talented people, but in the, into the future, it has to be an essential, uh, essential characteristics for everybody. And uh, also, I, I, I think that uh, we uh, have to just to foster the um, ability of uh, communication, the real mm. empathy mm. through uh, uh, people. Because technological, uh, technology is always uh, um, a tool to just uh, reflect your own yeah. human nature. Mm. Like it's, 
it's like an avatar. It's an so, yeah. so if you would like to cooperate with each other, then the uh, technological te things will just help you. If you just fight against each other, then technology will also help you. So it's so always about human nature. It's about how we see each other, how we see ourselves. Mm. So I, I think that education is really, really essential in this, but, but, at this mm. moment. But this is turning out to be a horrible panel, eh, because we all agree. <laughs> it's, uh, it's good that we all agree because... Uh, I mean, but we agree on the good thing. Currently, I yeah. see too much disagreement around the world. But, Lauren, so you need to come in. start correctly. Yeah, yeah I, I think what you're hearing from, from my fellow um, panelists, and I think would, would in, in, in somewhat granular form, is you ask the question, how do we all get on the same page? And I don't know that we all need to be on the same page in the way that we might typically think of being on the same page, right? My definition of of what success and opportunity might look like may be quite different mm. than someone else's. Mm. But the thing that we share is that the fourth industrial revolution and the changes that are associated with it mm. have both the, the opportunity and, and the benefit mm. of creating opportunity for mm. lots of different people mm. in lots of different flavors in lots of different ways. Mm. It's not necessarily going to happen naturally mm. because there are folks that want to take a winner-take-all yeah. approach. Yeah. But the partnership between the public sector, between the private sector, between civil society, between us as individuals, yeah. between, small, between small communities and big cities and big nation states, yeah. needs to be focused on how do we make sure that that opportunity is created, whether it's through education, whether it's through reskilling, whether it's through any number of different discrete policy and, and yeah. societal moves that we need to make. Yeah. That we will all be on the same page around, around, the oppor around creating opportunity yeah. so that we can fully realize the benefits yeah, like, of like, what's coming. Like the ends. Um, like the so ends. Yeah. I think yeah. we've had a terrific conversation and we've, we've had a terrific opportunity at this World Economic Forum to have a look at innovation and the fourth industrial revolution and to think more deeply about how we manage some of the issues in our own lives. What I want to do here, just to wrap up, is very quickly, can we give our audience something to take away, perhaps some practical advice, a point, an idea that would help them as they go forward and think about the fourth industrial revolution and the benefits and how to make it inclusive? Lauren, let me start with you very quickly. I think the thing that, that I would want all of us to take home is that even, as, even in the face of massive change and even in the face of the coming disruption, there is dignity in the life of every single solitary human being on this planet. And it is, in, it is incumbent upon all of us to think about how those changes can benefit each of those individuals who deserve an opportunity to, to realize the benefits that the rest of us may have access to. Maria Elena. Yeah, I would uh, encourage people to see an opportunity in what the speed of the things that are happening, right? It's not only challenges, you know, step, step a little bit back and think there's an opportunity on this new technology or not. And um, maybe be a bit more critical thinking. I think that could mm -hmm. already help. Dan. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can I also say just amen? Or yeah. No. Um, <laughs> no I think it, it, it's extremely important to move away from the, the social media opinion culture and drag it into proposals. And when you do something new, when you do innovation, there will always will be some people telling you it's not possible, it's not allowed, it cannot be done, it already exists, it's too beautiful, it's too ugly, it's too fast, it's too slow. Mm. Um, and it's my job, your job, our job, to prove them wrong. How Jing Fang? I think the, uh, whenever we have uh, a lot of uh, disagreement with each other about the real world, we can ask uh, us a question: What kind of world would you would you like mm -hmm. for your kids uh, uh, to to live in when he's he or her grown up? So I, I think that uh, when we ask uh, uh, ourselves about this question, a lot of people have the same answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question is: uh, What would you? like your kids to become in that such kind of world. So when we think about uh, our kids, uh, think about our uh, kids' future, and then we will all agree that we hope that world is um, uh, peaceful, is very uh, prosperous, and uh, very inclusive, then 
we shall create that world for our kids. And very appropriate that we finish on a Chinese voice here yes. in China. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could you please express your thanks to our panel and thank you everybody for tuning in for this CNBC special from the World Economic Forum in Dalian.